If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's Metaphysical Evolution Religion, 17 videos. UFOs, Ghosts, Magic, Spiritual Warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawites, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, Idolatry and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos, Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos, Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos, Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos, Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos, End Times, Supernatural Prophecies and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. Our videos are free to the viewing public. If you'd like to be immediately notified of our latest uploaded videos, then please subscribe to our C Answers TV YouTube channel. If you have an existing YouTube account, then simply click on the subscribe button at the top of our channel page next to our ministry name, Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. If you don't have a YouTube account, then it is easy to set one up at no cost. Just search YouTube, then the YouTube opening page will appear, and to the left-hand side will be a blue button saying Create Account. Click on that and follow the instructions. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would, to the book of Romans. And I'd like to begin this morning by reading from a portion out of the Word of God in Romans 6 and then in Romans 8. I'd like to start reading in Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. 
And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And then if we could look at Romans 8, starting in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In the book of Romans, we find a systematic presentation of the gospel. And in the first chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul makes this introductory statement about the gospel itself. And it's really the theme of the entire book. He says, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. The power of God. Now, what Paul is saying is that when an individual hears the message of the gospel and responds in true repentance and faith and is united to the Lord Jesus Christ, it results in a radical transformation of heart and life in that individual. It not only results in deliverance from sin and its guilt and in deliverance from the consequences of sin, those eternal consequences being hell, but it also delivers from sin's power and sin's dominion, resulting in a life of sanctification. Now, this is a truth that the evangelical church of our day desperately needs to hear. Because all too often in its teaching on the gospel, by its preachers and its teachers, sadly, all too often, these preachers and teachers separate faith and works. And they claim that the Reformation teaching, which we know as sola fide, which is the Latin phrase meaning faith alone, they claim that this teaching means that salvation does not include repentance from sin, and it does not include sanctification as a necessity. Such a claim is completely false. The reformers never separated faith from works. They unanimously taught that sanctification, which means the works of holiness and love, that's basically what it means, that the works of holiness and love will always be produced by saving faith. Always, without exception. That works are the evidence of a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Martin Luther is representative of the reformers when he says this, we do not reject good works. Nay, we embrace them and teach them in the highest degree. It is not from works that we are set free by the faith of Christ, but from belief in works. That is, from foolishly presuming to seek justification through works. Justification does not depend upon our works, although good works neither can nor ought to be absent. 
Next time you hear someone criticizing Martin Luther is teaching that sola fide means no works, you can say you are absolutely wrong. And you can multiply quotations like this many times over from every single reformer. Not one, not one ever said that you could be saved and live a life of sin. In fact, the Scottish church in its confession makes the statement that it is absolute blasphemy to suggest that a person can know Jesus Christ and be justified and not have the spirit of sanctification. The popular evangelical teaching on faith alone is not representative of the teaching of the Reformation. It's not representative of the teaching of the Reformers. It's a tragic departure from that teaching. But what is worse is the fact that it is primarily a departure from the teaching of Scripture. See, the thing that's so condemning about it is not that they disagree with the Reformers. It's the fact that the Reformers are teaching Scripture, and in disagreeing with the Reformers, they're disagreeing with Scripture. It is unbiblical because Scripture says that the Christ who justifies is the Christ who sanctifies. Hebrews 2.11 refers to Jesus in this way. It says, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. And Jesus is described there as one who sanctifies. That's one of his purposes in salvation. You cannot separate sanctification from justification in the overall work of salvation. It's a multifaceted work. And when God saves us, he saves us from sin. Now this is a truth that is emphasized very forcefully in the book of Romans. I mean, you cannot help looking at what we just read and have that impact you in a very forceful way. He's talking about a transformation. In the book of Romans, Paul sets forth the truth of the gospel in a systematic way. He talks about justification. The fact that justification is not based upon our works. But then in Romans 6, he goes into a description of what it means to be a Christian and to know Christ. And it's very clear he is talking about a sanctification process. There are two major errors that Paul deals with in the book of Romans. One is legalism. And the other is antinomianism. Legalism is the teaching that says you can somehow contribute to the attaining of your salvation through your own works. Jesus is important. Jesus is necessary. But Jesus is not sufficient. You've got to have your own works to merit your own salvation in some way. That's legalism. Antinomianism is the teaching that works are not part of salvation at all. That there are no works. Both are heresies. Roman Catholicism is legalistic. And unfortunately, much of evangelicalism is antinomian. The big question in the gospel has to do with the law. What is the relationship of the law to salvation? On the one hand, we have the truth of justification in which Paul states that this aspect of salvation is given as a gift, as we saw yesterday, completely apart from works because it is grounded upon the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is sufficient. He's done it all. And yet he also emphasizes that while works are as merit are completely eliminated, works as fruit are not. Let's take a look at Romans 6. You notice how he starts. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might increase? You see, the charge leveled against Paul by his legalist opponents, because that's who he's dealing with here. He's dealing with legalists. He's dealing with Jews. He said, God gave us the law so that we could keep the law and be saved. And Paul says, you don't understand. The law makes you sin more. And so they level this charge against him in terms of his grace teachings. You're saying that you can live in license. So they're saying that his teaching of justification by faith alone, apart from the works of the law, produces antinomianism or a license to sin. 
Your grace teaching, Paul, eliminates necessity for obedience to the law. And what does Paul say? God forbid. God forbid. You don't understand what a Christian is or the nature of salvation if you can even suggest such a thing. Salvation in Christ delivers us from sin. It's guilt and it's condemnation and also it's power and dominion. We are eternally set free from the law. We're set free from the law. That is from its condemnation. From the requirement that we perform a perfect obedience to be acceptable to God. Because that is the requirement. If we sin and transgress the law, the law says we must die. Therefore, we have no hope. We cannot make ourselves acceptable to God because the law of God condemns us. We've transgressed it. Therefore, Jesus Christ had to fulfill the law of God for us as a representative man, as a substitute. That's what he has done. And through a relationship with him, we are set free from the law's condemnation because the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is perfect, is imputed to us. Our sin was imputed to him. He has paid the penalty of that transgressed law for us, and we are set free from its condemnation. But we are now changed to obey it. Not to merit salvation, but to live a life of love for our Lord and a life that pleases Him. We are delivered from the dominion of sin in our union with Jesus Christ so that we walk in newness of life. We become new creations if we truly know the Lord Jesus Christ. We become what Paul describes here as slaves of righteousness. Paul says, how can such people as we who have died to sin still live in it? How can such as we who have died to sin, who have encountered the living Christ and who have gone through this remarkable, supernatural transformation, even think about living in sin. He says, it is impossible because of the miracle that takes place within an individual that comes to know Jesus Christ. Paul says, it is impossible for a person to be united to Christ and not live a sanctified life because of his union with Jesus. Notice what he says starting in verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of of his resurrection, that's power. That's a new life. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away or rendered inoperative, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Individuals united to Jesus Christ have died to sin. They have been resurrected to a new life. They are new creations in Jesus Christ. They have a new nature and a whole new power energizing them by the indwelling spirit. And they share in the resurrection life and the power of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the power of the universe. Can you imagine the power of the universe entering your life and it doesn't change? That is impossible. If I held up a piece of paper before you and took a match and lit that match and I put that match next to that paper, you think there would be a change? It will change. You take a sinful soul dead in sin and you bring that sinful soul in contact with the creator of the universe who is omnipotent and he raises that soul from the dead. And that person's a new creation. In Romans 7, 4, Paul speaks of the spiritual union of Christians with Jesus Christ. He says they're joined to him 
And the result is that they bring forth the fruit of obedience. He says, therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that you might bear fruit for God. To bear fruit for God out of union with Jesus Christ. So the believer in Christ has died to sin. Its bondage has been broken and he has set free and made alive unto God. And as a consequence of this miracle of transformation, the believer now has the power and the ability to obey God. And that's why Paul enjoins these believers in verse 12. He says, therefore, in light of what has taken place in your life, in light of what is true of you in union with the Lord Jesus Christ, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. You do not have to sin. The temptation is there. The flesh is there. But you have died. It's been rendered inoperative. It's not eradicated. But you have now been released from its bondage. And Paul says you can obey the living God by the power of God. You are to obey God, he says, and use the members of your body as instruments of righteousness. And Paul emphatically states that sin shall not be master over a true Christian, for he is now in the realm of grace, and grace infallibly reigns in righteousness in a person's life. And then in the remainder of Romans 6, Paul re-emphasizes the nature of this radical change that has taken place in the life of the one who has experienced salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has become a slave of Christ and of righteousness. The believer has a new master where he used to be a slave of sin and a slave to himself with the result being death. He's dead to God. He now has obeyed the gospel, as Paul says. You've obeyed the gospel from the heart and you've become one with God. And you've received a new life characterized by power and life and obedience. Notice what he says in verse 17 of Romans 6. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. That's the gospel. And they responded biblically to that gospel message and they came to know Jesus Christ and there's a transformation that took place in their life. In verse 22, Paul says, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your fruit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. Now this is, this is sort of going back to what we were talking about in our message uh, yesterday about lordship. You note here that Paul characterizes the relationship that delivers from sin and results in sanctification as one of lordship. They are enslaved to God. What does it mean to be set free from sin? You become a slave of God. You become a servant of God. And the corresponding word to servant in Greek is kurios, which is Lord. I become submissive to the living God through a lordship commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the God-man. When he comes into my life as Lord to take over, I am freed from sin's power because he comes in to rule and he displaces that old sinful self. Apart from this relationship, there is no deliverance from sin. There is no fruit of sanctification. There is no power and there is no eternal life because there is no union with Jesus Christ. The sanctification as a process flows out of a setting aside of my life in a commitment, a consecration to the Lord Jesus Christ. The process 
flows out of a commitment. If there is no commitment to the Lordship of Christ, there can be no process or fruit of sanctification. In Romans 8, Paul goes on to amplify his thoughts in Romans 6, the thought of a transformed life. But he expresses it a little differently. He talks here about a new law to which the believer is subject in Jesus. The law of the spirit of life, which has delivered the believer from another law that held him in bondage, what he calls the law of sin and death. He starts out in Romans 8, in verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's justification. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's sanctification. Paul then goes on to illustrate the contrast between two kinds of people. There are those who are described as being in the flesh, and there are those he describes as being in the spirit. Now, it's not uncommon to hear certain teachers refer to those who are in the flesh here as carnal Christians. These supposedly are Christians who simply have not learned how to walk in the spirit and they live carnal lives. In other words, there is nothing distinctively different between them and the people of the world other than the fact that they have professed Christ. They haven't learned how to walk in the spirit. But that is not what Paul means here. In Romans 8, 9, he makes that really clear to us. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit is to be in the spirit. To be in the flesh is to be devoid of the spirit. So this is a description of an unregenerate state of a lost person. A person who is in the flesh does not know Christ. He's lost. He's unregenerate. And so Paul gives us the contrast between the Christian here and a non-Christian. Those who are in the spirit express this new law of life by obeying the law of God. They have the ability to obey because they have the power to obey from the Holy Spirit who indwells them. And the experience that they have is one of life and peace. Those on the other hand who are in the flesh, who are devoid of the Spirit, Paul says they have no power to obey the law of God. He says in Romans 8, 7, they do not subject themselves to the law of God for they are not even able to do so. And the word able here is a derivative of the word dunamis in Greek. It's the word power. It's the word that we get dynamite from. And what he's saying here is that these people are devoid of power to obey God because they're devoid of the spirit. And therefore, they live in accordance with the sinful desires of the flesh and their experience is one of powerlessness and death. Let's just read again the description that Paul gives, starting with verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So it's a stark contrast. And in verses 12 to 14, Paul emphasizes the fact that the proof that an individual is indwelt by the Holy Spirit and is united to Christ and is a son of God is the fact that he puts to death the evil deeds of the body by the power of the Holy Spirit. Such a person, he says, will live. But he warns that those who live according to the flesh will die. They are not sons of God. 
He says, so then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Ability. Power. Obedience. In Romans 6 and 8, Paul is giving an absolute contrast between the Christian and the non-Christian. Saying, folks, you need to understand something about the nature of salvation. When you're united to Jesus Christ, there's a transformation of life. That person has whole new desires because they have a new heart and a new nature. They are indwelt by the God of the universe and his spirit, and they are empowered to live a life pleasing to God because that's the great desire of their hearts. And the Spirit of God causes it to happen. The Christian is a sanctified person who has experienced a radical transformation of life. He's no longer under the law, but under grace. He is no longer in the flesh. He's now in the Spirit. And he is no longer in bondage to sin and unable to obey the law of God because he has no power. He now has power. He's been set free from bondage to sin. And he now has the ability to be subject to the law and to obey its commands. Not to earn salvation, but to live a life of love for the Lord. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Don't ever think obedience is not important. As Paul says in Romans 6, the Christian becomes a slave of righteousness. He no longer experiences death and despair, but life and peace. And that's a contrast that's given us by Paul between those who are in the flesh, the unsaved, and those who are in the spirit, the saved. And this teaching corresponds to the overall teaching of the rest of the New Testament. The New Testament testifies to the fact that salvation and conversion results in this radical transformation of heart and life and mind of an individual. So radical that it's called a new creation. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that life becomes infused with a power that was never there before. So that whether in living the Christian life or in ministry, the believer is able to live by and is energized by the power of God. The gospel is the power of God to salvation because it unites a person to the God of of the universe. When Paul preached to the Thessalonians, he said, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and with full conviction and in the Holy Spirit. Why could he say that it came with power? Because he goes on to say this about them. You turn to God from idols to serve a true and living God transformation the Holy Spirit in all his power invaded their lives and they were converted their lives transformed and now they are the servants of God delivered from idols delivered from sin to serve the living God Paul wrote to the Ephesians he's saying they used to be dead in sin and used to live according to the desires of the flesh but no more now they have been made alive together with Christ, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He tells the Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, that's transformation. Why can they do that? Because it's God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to do what is pleasing to him. And what's pleasing to him is obedience to his word. They have the ability to work 
and to do the will of God. You need to keep the word work in the back of your minds. We're going to encounter that again. Finally, in Philippians 4, Paul gives us a testimony about himself. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do the will of God no matter what it is, no matter what I'm faced with. I can do His will because the living Christ strengthens me. I'm a new creation with a new life. Now that doesn't mean that the Christian is perfect. Far from it. Scripture does not teach perfection this side of heaven. You struggle with sin. A Christian struggles against sin because that flesh is not eradicated. It's just rendered inoperative. But it makes its presence known all too well. Christian struggles against sin. He hates it. He's not perfect. But the overall bent of a Christian's life is towards obedience. It's towards righteousness. He hungers and thirsts for righteousness, not sin. The Apostle John says, we know by this that we've come to know Him if we keep His commandments. That's obedience. But then he also says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have an advocate before the Father, before the throne of God, who will by His grace forgive our sin. If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John, when he makes the statement about obedience, he's not talking about perfection. But he is talking about a real obedience. The Apostle Paul talks about the struggle against sin in Galatians 5. And he makes it clear there is a struggle. But he also makes it clear that he says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. There is the ability to obey. And John goes on to say, no man born of God can practice sin because his seed abides in him. He cannot sin as a practice because he's born of God. That's the same thing Paul is saying in Romans 6. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? You're not going to live in it. It's impossible to continue to live in sin because of the miracle that's occurred in our life. We're a completely new creation with a new law operative in our lives. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus which has set us free from the law of sin and death. And this is why Scripture is so emphatic in its teaching about sanctification and the necessity for sanctification. If faith has no works, James says, it's dead. You've got a dead faith. You have no works. You have no sanctification. You have no life of holiness, no life of love. Don't say you're a Christian. You're deceived, is what he's saying. You've got a dead faith, and you need to come to Christ and commit your life to Christ in a biblical way so that your life can be transformed, so that you can do the will of God for His glory. Pursue sanctification without which no one will see the Lord, we're told in Hebrews. Without sanctification, you will not see the Lord. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. That's Jesus' purpose. He does not fail in His purpose. He will purify you as His own if you are His own and make you zealous for good works. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. His purpose for dying was that He might bring us to Himself that we might be enabled to do His will. For that's what we're created for. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. I'd say sanctification is rather important. We cannot separate works from faith. If it's true saving faith, you're going to have the evidence of works. Saving faith always results in a life of holiness and obedience because the Christ who justifies also sanctifies. And his omnipotence transforms our lives. What about Romans 7? How are we to understand the teaching of this chapter in light of what Paul has taught in Romans 6 and 8? I've spent a great deal of time examining this chapter, going through this chapter literally word for word, verse by verse, and looking at it in the overall context of Paul's teaching in Romans. Let's go through this in an overview fashion, see if we can follow the flow of Paul's thought, the main point he's trying to emphasize. And it's clear this is not an easy passage to understand. I've come to certain convictions about this passage after really wrestling with what I think the, the, the text is saying. I just respectfully submit it to you to follow along with me and just see what you think. And I think if we keep the overall context of Romans in mind, we will be able to understand the main truth embodied in this passage because I think Paul's trying to get at one fundamental truth. See, after dealing in Romans 6 with the charge of antinomianism by the legalists, Paul returns in chapter 7 to the theme of the purpose of the law of God and the whole issue of legalism. He's going to establish the point that legalism is bankrupt because of the nature of man. That if you think that you have the ability to keep the law, you are incredibly deceived, and he's going to show us why. The only way an individual can bear the fruit of righteousness is to go through a radical change in relationship to the law and be united to Jesus Christ and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so in the first three verses of Romans 7, in the illustration of the marriage relationship, Paul states that a true Christian has died to the law and its condemnation in Christ. Legally, the believer in Christ is justified from condemnation of the law and set free from its requirements for perfect obedience. And the, the believer has died to the law because Christ perfectly fulfilled its demands. He's no longer under the law. He's married now, no longer to the law, but to Christ. He has a new husband, if you will, if you put it in those terms. Not only that, he is joined to Christ in order that he might now bear fruit for God. This is the same verse we looked at just a moment ago. It says, therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. So fruit is the main issue in this chapter. And it has to do with righteousness or obedience to the law. So verse 4 sets the theme. And in the next two verses, in verses 5 and 6, Paul defines part of the purpose of the law and gives us a contrast between the law in relation to an unregenerate man and then a man who is born again and in the Spirit. In verse 5, Paul says this about the unregenerate person. You'll, you'll notice again this, this phrase that was used in Romans 8. For while we were in the flesh... The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. See, the main characteristic of this person's life is that he's in the flesh. This is his state of being. The fruit of his life is disobedience. The result is death. And the law actually incites this person to sin more. Rather than keeping it, he actually sins more. It arouses sin in him. And thus, rather, being, rather than being able to obey it, he actually continually disobeys it. 
Now that goes back to Paul's statement. He's got the, the kernel of this truth that he's expounding on here in kernel form in Romans 3 and in Romans 5 where he speaks of the purpose of the law. In Romans 3.20, he says, it is impossible for anyone to be justified by the law because through the law comes a knowledge of sin. And then in Romans 5.20, he says, the law came in that transgression might increase. So the law here has a purpose. And he's stating that principle again here in verse 5. And then I believe he amplifies this principle in personal terms in Romans 7, verses 7, all the way to the end of the chapter. I think this entire passage is an illustration of what he's presenting in general terms in Romans 7, 5. Now in contrast to this person who's in the flesh is the individual described in verse 6 as being in the spirit. But now we've been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. But Paul here speaks of the Christian as one who can serve God in newness of the power of the Holy Spirit. And he further amplifies the teaching of this verse, beginning, I believe, with Romans 8, 1, and then going through verse 17, where he speaks about the new law of the Spirit being affected in the life of the believer, setting him free from the law of sin and death, enabling him to obey the law of God. So Paul begins Romans 7 with a contrast between two kinds of people, those who are in the flesh, those who are in the spirit. Those who are in the flesh, when confronted with the law, find they cannot obey it. In fact, they sin more. Those, however, who are in the spirit bear the fruit of righteousness and a sanctified life through obedience to the law. Well, let's look for just a minute at these verses from Romans 7, 7 to 25 what I believe is the expanded explanation of Paul's statement in verse 5. This passage gives insight into how the law brings an unconverted man who is a legalist under conviction of sin and brings him to see his need for Jesus Christ. It demonstrates the utter fallacy of legalism, the thinking that man is capable through obedience to the law to attain a righteousness that will bring acceptance with God and result in life. Paul begins this section by answering an objection again that would be raised to his teaching where he says the law actually incites sin. Oh, yeah, right, Paul. After all, it brings about a sinful result. This is blasphemy, Paul. What does Paul say? Same thing he said before. God forbid. God forbid that I would ever impugn the law. The law is good because it reveals God's standard of righteousness and the meaning of sin. There's nothing wrong with the law. He says in Romans 7, 12, it's holy, it's righteous, and it's good. Nothing wrong with the law of God. No, 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 no. The problem, folks, is not with the law. The problem is with me. So in this passage, Paul will endeavor to demonstrate three major purposes of the law. It's going to define for us the nature of righteousness. It's a standard which God sets before us of what is acceptable to Him in the way we live. Secondly, it's going to define the nature of sin and reveal to man His innate sinfulness and corruption. It's going to reveal His bondage to sin. And what it's going to do is bring conviction of sin And then finally, through experience and through the law itself, it's going to point him to the Lord Jesus Christ as a deliverer from sin, from its guilt and bondage. See, Paul had a very high view of himself before he took the law seriously. In verse 10, he says that initially his attitude towards the law was that he would find life. This law which was to result in life for me. So oh, I'm going into this deal, I'm, I can do this, I'm going to get life from this. He says he was in for a rude awakening. Rather than experience obedience in life, he experienced disobedience in death. The law, he said, produced in him coveting of every kind. It produced it. Well, all it did was show him his inability 
and reveal to him the utter sinful depravity of his own heart. That's exactly what the law is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring conviction of sin to us because we see our inability to keep it. It reveals to Paul his sinful nature. In verse 13, he says, Therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good that sin might become utterly sinful. Now, who's it going to show it to? It's revealing that to Paul. I'm a sinner. I think I'm going to gain life through obedience. Lo and behold, I'm exactly the opposite of what I thought. Paul comes to the realization, I'm a hopeless, helpless, depraved sinner. The Holy Spirit is using the law to reveal to Paul his true condition, his terrible need, that he's a slave of sin. There's nothing wrong with the law. Paul says it's good, it's perfect, and it's holy. And Paul could say that in his unconverted state. He could delight in the law of God and the inner man. This is good. This is a good standard. This is life as it should be lived. And Paul comes to the realization that the law by nature is spiritual and he is not. To keep the law, you have to have a spiritual nature. Paul comes to the conclusion that he is of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. And what's that a description of? In the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. I'm unregenerate. I'm lost. That's the same phrase used in Romans 7, 5 and Romans 8 to describe an unconverted man. The Holy Spirit does not dwell in him. When he says he's in bondage to sin, he is coupling that with being in the flesh, which is the condition of men who are unconverted. A converted man is not in the flesh. He's in the spirit. And he is freed from bondage to sin. Paul comes to the conclusion that he's a sinner, a slave of sin. How does he come to that conclusion? That's wrought in him by painful experience. He has this optimistic and Pollyanna view about the law and his own ability, and it gets completely shattered in the light of his actual practice. His mind has been illuminated by the Holy Spirit to see the innate goodness of the law, and he sincerely desires to obey it. As he says in verses 18 to 22, he wishes to do good, but he states that he continually practices unrighteousness. He finds he has no ability or power. The wishing is present in me, but the doing or the working of the good is not. There it is working. I can't work. Can't do it. But he told the Philippians, work because it is God who is at work in you to do and to will of his good pleasure. In his own converted state, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But in the unconverted state, he says, I cannot subject myself to the law of God. I'm not able. So his practice is one of continual disobedience and his experience is, is that of death. He says, wretched man that I am, despair. Who will set me free from the body of this death? See, that's precisely the description that's given of the unconverted man in the first verses of Roman 8. It's completely contrary, again, to Paul's own testimony of his own life after he came to know Christ. So I believe that Paul comes to the realization here that there's something fundamentally wrong with him, that he's a prisoner of the law of sin. He's a slave of sin. He wants to do the will of God, and he finds he has no ability I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. See, Paul is not upset here with the fact that he has to struggle against sin. That's not what he's upset about. He's not upset about the fact that he can't be perfect. He's upset about the fact that there is no performance at all. There is no ability, there is no power, there is no obedience. He is in bondage, a prisoner of sin. And that realization and experience leads him to self-despair. It brings him to brokenness. It brings him down. 
in humility. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, I need deliverance. I need a Savior. And of course, that's precisely what the gospel offers in Christ. That is precisely what the law is supposed to do. Point us to Jesus Christ as the one who can deliver us from sin. Paul says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the law then has done its work through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to be a tutor to bring him to Christ, as it says in Galatians 3.24, that he might find deliverance from the guilt and dominion of sin. And that is what he finds in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Where is it? In Christ. Where is he in Romans 7? In the flesh. Dead in sin. But what does he find in Jesus? Deliverance. A savior. Freedom. Power. Salvation in Jesus Christ always results in a life of holiness and obedience. It produces works. We're justified by faith alone, completely apart from the works of the law through union with Jesus Christ. But that union produces holiness of life because the individual is raised from the dead. He is a new creation, born again of the Spirit of God, delivered from bondage to sin and dwelt by the Holy Spirit and becomes a partaker of the power of God that raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, which energizes him and enables him to obey. There is no salvation apart from sanctification. Because if there's no sanctification, there is no relationship with the person who saves. The Apostle John says, By this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Jesus Christ is a savior from sin, from its guilt, from its power, from its dominion, and from its eternal consequences. He is Lord and savior. And the call of the gospel is for men and women to receive our Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through repentance and faith that they might be delivered from sin and be brought into a personal relationship with the living God in order that we might fulfill the purpose for our creation to glorify His name by worshiping, loving, serving, and obeying Him both now and throughout all eternity. Is there evidence in your life that you know Jesus Christ? If you come into the experience that the Apostle Paul found in the Lord Jesus Christ, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord who delivers me from sin's bondage and from sin's guilt. I pray that the Lord would give us grace to know in our hearts that we truly belong to Him. For He does give that assurance to us if we belong to Him. And if not, that we will fully commit our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be saved. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. 
Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -S -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the Jesus is